Hi, Kerner Tex here and this video is all about setting up your own local R-Sync mirror for Gen 2 system. There's two parts actually to this video. The first part is to do with this mirror and the second part is to do with sharing a file system with the source files for Gen 2 updates. So what I'll do is explain both of these parts in a little bit more detail now. Um, I'll start one of these machines off, Gen 2 machines, which will help the explanation as well. So the first issue we've got when running several Gen 2 machines is that when we want to update those machines, we're only allowed to connect to the Gen 2 um, mirrors for getting the um, package details updated. We're only, to, we're only allowed to do that once a day. Um, this is because the um, R-Sync that's used, the protocol that's used to transfer the data is quite CPU intensive and there's thousands, tens of thousands of files and directories so um, it, it's quite quite a load on on the C, on the PC CPU, uh, which is the reason why it's restricted. So the idea is that we're going to set up our own private R-Sync mirror, and then what we do is we get that mirror to sync with the public mirror once a day, and then we reconfigure all our other Gen 2 computers to point to our own private mirror which means that we can sync up and um, get get updates from that um, local mirror as many times as we want within within 24 hours with, without risking having our IP address blocked. And in addition to that, it's something that's separate from that issue, but it's related because it's to do with updates and it's to do with the portage tree the second part is to install a network file system server, an NFS server, on the server machine uh, to act as a repository for storing all of the tarballs that are downloaded when we do actual package updates. So if, if you've got several Gen 2 machines, each one of those machines will be downloading its own copy of all the packages. So for example, um, Firefox, Chromium, LibreOffice are some of the among some of the biggest packages. Um, you know, Chromium's probably about half a gigabyte in size. If you've got say ten machines downloading their own copies, then that's five gigabytes of disk space that's being taken up. Add in the fact that you've got updates, regular updates, and within a matter of weeks and months, you, you soon be you know taking up a combined space of twenty, thirty, forty or more gigabytes. So as I say the idea is to have a common repository that all your Gen 2 machines can access where you have just one copy of each of the source tarballs that you, you download as part of the updates. And basically the first machine that downloads that tarball will save it to the server and then any subsequent machines that have the same update require the same source um, file source tarball will see that the file is actually already there on the server and it won't need to download it or just take the copy that's already there. So it's uh, efficient in that you're only downloading the tarball once so it saves you on network bandwidth if that's important to you and it's also efficient in that over a local network it's likely to be a lot quicker than downloading it over the internet so um, you should notice that your updates will be a little bit faster for the subsequent installs of the um, tarballs on different machines. So uh, what I'm going to do now is just log in to this machine and just show you the structure on the disk um, where all the files and directories are that we'll be updating if, if you're not already aware of them. So I'm just going to get a file manager up first and go to root and let's put this on details. 
Right, so under user directory, there's a directory called portage, and within that are directories representing each of the different categories within the portage database. So, for example, we could look at um, games util as a category, and then within that is the actual packages. So, there's a, a package there, for example, called dzip. And then the files and directories within these package directories are have got an ebuild file and manifest data as well, which describes things about the build. You know what versions are available, where to fetch the tables from, and how it's built, what use flags are available, and so on, things like that. So this is the part that drives the automation of of building packages from the source. So these are the files that get updated when you run Emerge Sync or EIX Sync. So all of these directories get updated. Apart, there are one or two exceptions because there there are a couple of directories in here that are related to the actual running of Portage, like meta metadata, if you like. Um, and one of them is particular interest to us because it's to do with the second part about keeping a repository of source files so currently if you've got multiple gen 2 machines each one of them will have a user portage disk files directory and inside that directory will be all the source files that have been downloaded to date since you built the gen 2 machine um, and you can see there's um, all sorts of different packages there some are basic packages like bin utils uh, there's patches for bin utils and so on and others are apps. For example, there's two Chrome versions there. You can see one's 677 megabytes and one's 714 megabytes. So combined, those two alone are approximately 1.4 gigabytes. And as I say, if you're having multiple machines, so 10 machines, that's 14 gigabytes of hard disk space taking up unnecessarily, where you could just be having one 1.4 gig taken up with one copy so so that's the two parts we're gonna get this this part to sync locally we're gonna set the server up to get the public uh, mirror synced onto its own machine and then we'll reconfigure all the other machines to go and fetch all this these updates from the local mirror that we will set up and the second part will be to set up an NFS server to move all the source files we've got onto that server and then reconfigure the server so that it it makes these files available and lastly we configure all the machines to um, to attach the shared files onto the local file system so I hope that makes a little bit more sense what what we're going to do here so I'll just shut this down for now Um, what we've got to do now to start off with is to get a uh, image of the server up. So what I've done here is I've taken copies of the Gen 2 uh, machines that I created when I was doing my installing Gen 2 videos. Um, and during those videos I took a clone of the Gen 2 system as it was built um, after at the end of the handbook so when when the system was complete but still a basic system I took that image which is the image I'm going to be using for the server because it's nice and basic there's no GUI it's unnecessary for a server and then the next image I've got is Gen 2 with a basic GUI and a browser and the final one I've got is a sort of fully featured uh, system with a, uh, an advanced GUI which is actually uh, KDE and some other apps and so on. So we've got a, a selection of machines with which to um, go through this demonstration. So to say first one off I'll boot the basic Gen 2 system and if you recall whenever we do an Emerge Sync or EIX Sync, rsync is used to synchronize the updates so this means that every Gen 2 system has got rsync already installed moreover 
uh, the rsync daemon is also available so all we need to do to set up this server initially is to configure the rsync daemon and start it and test it so it's uh, relatively simple we don't have to install rsync or anything else just a little bit of configuration so I've logged into onto my machine that's going to be the server logged in as root and first thing we need to do is to edit the rsync daemon file so it's an etc rsync d.conf and you can see there's a like an example a stripped down example file there with some information already in there so what we do then is we keep the first few lines and we delete the read only line because we don't want this um, module to be read only we want it to be able to be updated by the server at any time so let's get rid of that and we'll just add a few more lines to the config so the first one's max connections and as you might suspect this limits how many um, connections can be made to the rsync daemon at once so I set mine to five it's more than enough um, I wouldn't want any more because um, my my real server is uh, quite a slow machine and I haven't got that many machines to connect to anyway and five is quite a good number just for demonstrating if you've got a more powerful machine or you've got lots of um, machines that may need to be connecting then you might want to in increase that value uh, then we need to set UID parameter for telling the rsync daemon what user to run at <coughs> set that to nobody and the same with the group ID GID set that to nobody too uh, and then the next parameters are to um, specify which hosts we're going to allow to connect so if security is an issue this is something you'd want to use um, it's, it's not a mandatory option it's is, it is purely optional and you can specify IP addresses in several ways you can read them the manual of, about rsyncd.conf and it'll tell you all the ways to uh, of representing them but it's the usual ways you can represent them by individual IPs or you can represent a range like so so that, that last one means um, accept any IP address that begins with 192.168.0 and then also you can specify host to deny it so I'm going to deny everything else and another optional parameter you might want to put in is a MOTD file message of the day file so that would be something that the um, person or computer synchronizing would see a message appearing at the beginning of the sync and then obviously you'd have to go and create that file and you know put, put an appropriate message maybe saying something you know what system this is you know welcome message something like that so let's just check those those are already in uh, looks okay okay so then we go down to this bit and this is where we specify each module that the rsync daemon can um, support and the first one if we uncomment that first line there that's the name of this particular module so that's how you can refer to it within rsync and it's called gen2 hyphen portage then we specify a path where the synchronization is going to occur from and default is user portage now what I do is I separate the mirror uh, image of the portage tree from the local one reason being it means that the um, mirror can be updated at any time without affecting the copy that's used by the actual updates for the server so I may for some reason not want to update the image for the server 
as regularly as I do for the mirror. So by specifying a separate path, I've got control about when I do update the portage tree for the server rather than the mirror which would be available for any any other machine connecting. So what I'm going to do is change that and put it into full slash var portage. Then the comment, well quite self-explanatory, it's just a comment that's associated with this, this module name. And lastly the exclude line, it says within that path exclude the dist files directory because we don't want to sync up the um, source files. If we did that we'd likely lose what we've downloaded because uh, they're unlikely to be in the tree. Ev everybody's source dist files would be different so that, that wouldn't work at all. And then there's these other packages directory that we don't need as well so um, we'll leave that as it is. So if we now save that and next thing we must do is to create this directory because it won't exist. So make the slash var slash portage and then we want to change the ownership of that to um, I'll change mine to a local user and do the syncing as a normal uh, normal user and change the group to portage because that's the um, user that will be or the user group the group ID that um, will be managing the portage tree and we change that directory we just made so now we should be in a position to start the rsync daemon so if we run etc init d rsync daemon and then start it so that looks like that started ok, there's no errors and of course we need to add it to rc update so that it runs at boot time and we add rsync d to the default run level and we can just check that's there there it is so what uh, would be a good idea now is to see that the or to check that the rsync daemon is indeed running and serving um, that directory that's specified the var portage tree and what I'll do is I'll start off uh, let's start off this one here, it'll run a bit quicker a little bit quicker So I'll just move that out of the way. Make these fonts a little bit bigger, a bit more legible. Okay, so I've already got a note of my IP address of the server, so to test it I'll do rsync the IP address and then two colons and it's responded with the module name Gen2 Portage and the comment that's associated with that module so that means that the rsync daemon is running it's responded to our request uh, so that looks pretty good there's another test we can do, we can do the same command again and append the module name and what this will do it will show the files that are in that directory and as you can see at the moment it's obviously empty because we only just created it so it just displays the um, current directory the, the dot so we can maybe touch a file in that and we should be able to see that so I've created a file called test123 in that directory if we go back to this machine rerun that command you can see that there's an empty file there called test123 because we just touched that file so that, that proves that this rsync command is executing live against the server so it's, it's all connecting and it's working working well 
So let's just tidy up, remove that file. And again, I can go back and check that's gone now. And yes, it has. So that's OK. So shut this down. And I'll go back to the server. So what I'm going to do now, now that we've got the rsync daemon working, what I'm going to do now is to create a um, bash script which will um, pull some commands together to synchronize with the public server because obviously this directory is empty at the moment. So I'll just um, type some commands in the script file and then by having that script file it will also allow us to um, set that script to run inside a cron job at regular intervals once a day so it just automates things for us so I'm going to become the kernel text user my normal user to do this because I'm going to download it as the um, as, as a normal user and I'm going to edit a file called rsync gen2 Portage.sh. So, rsyncing, rsync's the command we're running, and Gentoo Portage is the name of the module that we're updating. Okay, so we'll start off with a um, shebang. So, I'm going to use bash, bin bash, you can of course use your own shell or sh and what I do here is just create a few variables with some of the details in for the commands. So the first one's the um, binary, the path to the binary including the binary name and then the ops variable has got all the options that our sync will have to use. So I've got verbose, recursive, links, perms, time, time, sorry, minus d, minus minus delete, and timeout. 300 in case the there's a problem. I'll just check that for both. Right, that's spelled wrong. For both recursive links, perms, times, minus d, delete, timeout equals 300. Okay. Then the next variable is the source. URI, so it's where our sync is going to sync from. Now, there's two places you can get this from. You can either get it from, if I save this file, you can get it from etc portage repose.conf, and then there should be a file in there called gen2.conf. And what you need to type in after source is. Um, everything after this sync URI so everything that's here is what you can copy in alternatively you can go to this web page just expand that you can see a bit more https www.gen2.org forward slash support forward slash rsync hyphen mirrors and what this has got on here well, it's got description about uh, the mirrors about how not to abuse them and what these rsync mirrors are for and basically you find um, a mirror that's in your region for speed and you copy any of these uh, URIs that are appropriate to your region and that's what you need to put into the script so that's what needs to go in this source between the quotes. Now you'll notice that I was using an IP address and not one of these on this page and that's because I've already got a real um, 
server that's syncing up every night so of course if I specify public server again that means I'm going to be connecting at least twice a day which is obviously going to cause problems so what I'm doing is rather than specifying one of these URLs in this demo I'm going to specify my own real mirror and mirror from my own mirror if that makes sense but you, you would want to um, specify one of these on this page so I'll just type that in now so rsync they all start with rsync colon forward slash forward slash and then the address of the um, repository that you're going to sync from the mirror that you're syncing from then uh, it will be the name of the module that you're syncing from so I think they're pretty much all Gen 2 portage then finally we have a destination variable which specifies where we want the sync to go to and of course we want it to go to VAR portage so now we can actually put in some scripting commands to do the work and we've put a little um, message here echo out saying um, uh, something like starting I'll sync update at and then we can put the date in and append that to a log file with the same name as the script we're running and redirect the errors to standard in uh, standard out as well sorry so that will just put a message out saying start in the rsync update at and the date and time and we can also add a little message into the system log so we say add a message with the rsync tag and we can put something like um, resyncing gen2 portage and then we can actually put in the commands so that's the first environment variable the sec uh, sorry first variable second one the third which is the source and the destination so you can see we've built up a command line here user bin rsync with those options from this location to this local location and again we redirect the output of that to the local log and redirect the errors to standard out as well and finally we can also print a little message out when it's completed saying and I've finished I'll sync update at okay so let's just check that so starting I'll sync update at date append that to log and redirect the errors any errors to the standard out that will send that message to the syslog then we run the command and then we print another message at the end saying we've finished the rsync update at date and time and that should be it so let's save that next thing we'll do is make that executable so chmod u plus x rsync gen2 portage.sh so that gives executable access you can see it's in the bright green now 
and it's got a little extra for the user. So the next thing to do is to run this script to populate the var portage file. So I'll just have one last look at it. And it's my cell slash var slash portage. You can see it's empty at the moment. So I'm going to time this because it does take about 10, 15 minutes to run. So I'll start that off and it looks like it's running. It's not putting anything out to the screen because it's logging everything. So what we can do is we can boot up one of these other machines again. Uh, let's load this one up this time. So the server's still running in the background, still syncing. You can see it hasn't finished yet. And if we SSH into the server now, okay, so I'm in the remote computer now doing ls minus l you can see there's the log file it's obviously creating something in there because the file size of it and it's increasing so we can do tail minus f to follow this log and we can monitor that so you can see it's updating each category and, and the packages within that so what I'll do is I'll leave that on the screen until it's finished and uh, come back when it's actually done about 10 let's say 10 15 minutes or so
Okay, so that is now synced up. So we can take a look at the our portage directory and you can see it's now been populated. There you go, 698 meg has been synced up. So, um, what should I do? Let me just get rid of this. Machine again. Go back to the server. So yeah, we've got the far portage, and I'll just show we've also still got the uh, local uh, repository, which is for this server machine to use when it needs to be updated. Um, and the reason why that's bigger is because it's got the dist files, which is populated with. Uh, source files, you can see it's 488 mega so so that's why the user portage is bigger than the file portage so the next thing we need to do is to for every single machine including the server is to reconfigure them the machines to use this um, uh, image mirror image of the uh, rsync repository that we've just uh, downloaded in far portage so I'm going to become the user uh, so the root user and what we need to do is to edit the repos file so in etc portage repos.conf and the gen2.conf file and what we need to do is change this rsync location from the public address to the local server address so I'm going to put in oops what have I done there we change this address to the IP address of the of this server that we're on so in my case it's 0 0.224 Gen2 Portage is obviously the name of the module for the rsync and we can save that now so we've done the server, the server when it gets its updates knows to get it from itself effectively by typing in its own address so if we now type in emerge minus minus sync and I'll stop this as soon as it starts to show Yep, there's, oh, let's just jump back for some reason. Here it says starting sync with the rsync. So you can see there's the address we just changed. So that proves that it's gone to the rsync daemon on, on this machine itself to get the updates that we've just downloaded off of the mirror. So I'll let that carry on now. You can see this will be a lot quicker because it's only got the changes to update, not the whole whole tree. Yeah, and that's finished now. So it looks like it did the update with just 22 megabytes of downloads. So it's, uh, yeah, there it is. They received 22 megabytes for a total of 219. So it's it's about 10% of the size that was updated of, of the directory. And you can see here also it's got the timestamp of the um, mirror server that we got the information from so we use in, in my case I use my own mirror and that's set to download at one, uh, 9 minutes past 1 every morning of every day so hence, hence the timestamp so I'll just wait for this to verify Okay, and it's updated and it even says that there's a an update to the portage package available so what I should do is if I just 
just a world update to start off with to show that it's brought on those changes and identified some packages to update. And there you can see it's got a few packages to pull in, including the Portage one. So I won't update that at the moment. Um, in fact, yes, I will. I'll, uh, I won't do the whole update. What I'll do is I'll update just the Portage program. Um, no, I won't actually. I will do that from one of the other machines when they've been configured. So what I need to do now is to do that same change to both of the other machines I've got. So let's start with the basic GUI machine. Just make this a bit more legible. So I'll become root, edit the etc portage repos.conf gen2.conf. Once again, I change this address to, so that it points at the server. Save it. And I'll do, I'm not sure if I've got the IX sync on here, why not? I haven't, so I'll do another emerge sync. So again, I'll do control S, and you can see it's using the server IP address, so that's all good. And it's downloading from the server that's running in the background now from this machine here. so that update's done so I'm just going to quickly run the emerge update command again just to see the changes have actually been pulled in and they, they look like they have because the sync's been successful but it'll just prove that the actual emerge program can see those updates as well Yep, so there's a few more being pulled in there. There's Firefox, Glib, and a couple more. So, yep, that's okay. So that's that one done. So now I'm going to do the uh, other GUI machine. Update that one in exactly the same way. And then that just proves that multiple machines can access this uh, R-Sync mirror the local one with no problems. So once again we come to the root and edit the etc portage repos.conf gen2.conf and modify the URI to the local server.
and we can now do an EIX sync on this one. So again that proves that we can access the new repository using a different tool. And oh, I just missed it there. Just scroll up again. And just to verify that it is using the local server there. updated successfully. Wait for the uh, signatures to be checked. Okay, so there's no need to run. There's no need to run the um, update command here because EIX kindly shows us what packages have been updated. So you can see there's a few more updates to do on this one. So that's all good. So the next thing we need to do is to uh, let me get these out of the way that's it is to set up a cron job on the server so that this script for syncing to the public mirror is just run once a day then we can just forget it it will just do its thing once a day and all our other machines are now currently syncing to the server so we don't need to even worry about whether or not we've synced up far too many times or not because all those machines, including the server itself, are syncing up to the local mirror of the rsync tree. So what we need to do here, we've got uh, a cron tool running crony because that was installed as part of the Gen 2 installation. So if you'd followed the Gen 2 videos, then you, you would have installed this yourself. Uh, if you haven't, you need to go to the handbook to find out how to install that and then come back here and you'll be able to set up a job for the cron server, so cron daemon. So what we should do is, first of all, go back to the kernel text user because it's the normal user that will be doing the updates as we did manually. And firstly, we should just double check that the editor variable, environment variable is set to a the variable it is. I don't know what that little blob there is in the front actually. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, another way we can do this is to check the eselect editor option. It's already set to via, so if, for example, yours is set to something else like one. Oh, sorry, let's become the root. Yeah, um, you'll need to Yeah, so if it's set to one, for example, you don't want to use that um, particular editor. So, for example, I've just changed mine to EX, but I don't really want that. You need to use the set command to set it to the option that you want. And then, as it says, you need to run the ETC profile to update the profile. 
So let me just log on this kind of text again because I didn't like that symbol that was there. Yeah, it's gone now. I don't, don't know where that appeared from. Um, actually, what I should do is close these other clients down to put less load on the system. And I'll boot them up again when I need to. So yeah, so we've verified that we've got the editor set correctly. So now we can run the command cron tab minus E, which uses that system variable to bring up the editor that's been set. And you see it's run VI with an empty file. And what we need to do here is to put in some details about when the job should run. Now I'm going to test it, so I'm just going to put five stars in. If you want to know what those fields are, the best thing to do is to go to the cron manual and read up on them, basically specify the hours, minutes, days and so on, months of when this job should run. But when you set them all to star, then the job will kick off at one minute interval, so it's quite useful for testing. So we need to put in the location of the script and the script name. and we'll redirect the output from that to the log that's used if there's any problems when it's been run as a cron job so let's just check that so it's home kernel text rsync gen2 portage.sh and redirect the output to home Kernatex rsync gen2 portage.sh.log and that's all we need to do so if we save that now so the cron's already running we can do an rc update to check that so at some time within the next minute it will start running there is crony is already running uh, so what we can do to verify that it's actually running is to monitor the log And the current time is 15.15, so we should see this um, start within, certainly within the next 30 seconds, I would say. So we'll just wait for it to start up by itself. Yep, there it is, it started, it's put the timestamp in. That's the little message we put in into the script and it's finished and again there's the message at the end so that that proves that the cron job is is actually running and executing successfully and of course there's no updates to do so i would say the next time this runs um yeah in fact let's stop this quickly before we uh spam the server uh so we'll just edit it again and we change these first two and I'm going to put in a zero and a three that means it's going to run at 3 a.m. every morning every day so I'll just save that so that will now run tomorrow morning in the early hours of tomorrow morning and it'll be worth checking to make sure after that automated uh, run had, it has actually updated it'll be worth checking to make sure it is working so that's all there really is to setting up the um, rsync local mirror. Um, the next part will be uh, all about setting up an NFS server for the source files. So thank you very much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next, next video. Goodbye.